Hello, my name is Blake Patterson, and welcome to Afro Reviews. On this week's episode, I discuss the best films of 2022. While I have not seen every film from last year, I have decided to create a list. Some choices will be covered in future reviews, and other selections have been reviewed on this channel. As for the motion pictures I missed, I will write about them at some point. Now, here are a few honorable mentions. Bodies, 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 The Cathedral, Mad God, Mona Lisa and the Blood Moon, and Vortex. Number 10, The Fablemans. When I first watched Steven Spielberg's semi-autobiography, I grew to enjoy the film as it went along. Then I revisited the film and liked its earlier scenes much more. In other words, The Fablemans is a work of art that grows after each observation. While the power of cinema and movie making is a narrow idea to extract from the film, I find The Fablemans much more fascinating in how Spielberg reflects on his childhood and adolescence particularly the parents' dysfunctional marriage and Sammy's anti-Semitic abuse in high school. When the young man enters John Ford's office, it is hard not to smile and tear up. Number 9, Marina. Antonetta Alamot Kuzijanovic's Marina. I probably butchered that name centers on a young woman who suffers from her abusive father but sees an opportunity to escape through his wealthy American friend's arrival. With inspiration from Eric Romare, the film is a coming-of-age story where its conventions feel fresh in the eyes of its young filmmaker. Some may not care for Kuzi Genovic's deliberation and Marina's enigmatic conclusion, but the film conveys the early accomplishments of an artist learning to spread her wings. Number 8, X. Through a subversion of archetypes and standards, X is a satire of religious prudishness and sexual repression during the sexual revolution. Each performer is amiably indelible as their archetype, deriving from Brian De Palma and Nicholas Rogue. Ty West creates a horror film with laughs, thrills, and intelligence. Even though I do not love Pearl as much as X, it also deserves acknowledgement due to Mia Goff. Number 7, Happening. Audrey Dewan's harrowing story follows a young, intelligent woman who has ambitions, but she eventually discovers her pregnancy. As a result, Anna Maria Vartolome's Anne struggles to get an abortion in 1963's France. Dewan creates a haunting, visceral experience of one woman's hardships to achieve what she wants when the government and others work against her. Happening provides a bleak look into one woman's dangerous journey in an oppressive society. Number 6. Petite Mamo. Celine Siama's Petite Mamo is the story of a young girl who goes to her late grandmother's home to clean up the house before they leave. This short film communicates themes of grief, abandonment, and the innocence of childhood. What Siyama creates is an abstract fantasy about the importance of connection in times of loss. Number 5, Glass Onion. While I was surprised by the film's backlash after its release, one of the reasons I loved Glass Onion was due to how Ryan Johnson crafted a satire within a murder mystery instead of lecturing the audience. Johnson's satirical targets include hypocrisy, racism, ignorance, and corruption in the age of social media where the elite sit comfortably unless they are on the verge of backlash. Each performer deserves credit for finding the root of the humor and alternating toward sincerity in apt moments. When most satires this year failed, Johnson succeeded in respecting the audience's intelligence. 
Number four, official competition. Unless you have been following my reviews for the last year, you may not have heard of Gaston Duprat and Mariano Cohn's splendid official competition. The film is a scathing satire of film industry egotism with excellent performances by Penelope Cruz, Antonio Banderas, and Oscar Martinez. Duprat and Cohn incorporate the eccentric director, a mainstream actor, and a stage performer to create a film with surprising maturity as it reaches its tragic climax. Number 3. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Given the frequency of Pinocchio adaptations, who would have expected Guillermo del Toro to create his best work since Pan's Labyrinth? By incorporating Pinocchio's story, del Toro intelligently subverts the narrative conventions through subplots involving fascism, prejudice, exploitation, and war. However, del Toro never loses track of the story's sense of loss, and one frequently feels the heartache of Geppetto and others through tears. Number 2, After Sun. In its poetic consideration of the past and present, Charlotte Wells directs a heartbreaking study of memories as they evolve into grief and regret. While I cannot say I admired him before, Paul Mescal went from being a handsome young man to an actor with emotional intricacy. Part of the film's genius is how Wells constructs her poem around a mystique regarding her father, and Mescal embodies this mystery to the fullest extent. Mescal and newcomer Frankie Corio are two brilliant aspects of an emotionally piercing achievement. And number one, Tar. No film has fascinated me more this year. It is rare for serious work to create such an active conversation these days, since most movies aim to please. Todd Field's Tar is the work of a man who has always been interested in the socio-political nature of the human condition. Field's undying, complex investment in provocative themes has given the world an exemplary portrait of an artist who has fallen victim to a cycle of systemic abuse. It is easy to categorize Lydia Tarr, but it defies the complexity of how she amazes and disturbs the viewers. Now, let me know what your favorite films were of 2022 in the comments section. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great night.